Hello, I'm Karen Bird. Did you know that this book, The Bible of the Christians and the Jews, talks about the United States? How can that be, some might ask? Well, if you have watched the 12 preceding programs, then you know there are a number of things that you can be sure of. You can be sure that we couldn't and didn't evolve. You can be sure that God knows the future with pinpoint accuracy and that his prophetic word is better than an eyewitness account. Perhaps you are unaware that God foresaw this great nation, knew how it would get started and even how it would end. Yes, end. Today, you can be confident that the same God who knew in advance that Babylon would be followed by Medo-Persia, and that kingdom would be followed by Greece, and that kingdom would be followed by Rome, and that kingdom would not be followed by another world empire, that same God also knew in advance what would be happening to us here in the U.S. Join us as Charles goes in search for the United States in Bible prophecy. I've lived outside the United States on more than one occasion, and I've traveled to places like Israel, Egypt, Bali, Tonga, Guam, and Europe. I like America. We are so blessed. I'm very thankful to live here with all the privileges and good fortune it affords. And I don't take this birthright for granted, for my family has personally felt the loss of one who has given the last full measure of devotion to ensure our liberty as well as that of others. But in all my travels around these United States, I see, especially in the post-World War II generation, a marked ignorance about why we are a great nation. It's not because we are better on the battlefield or better in the sports arena or better in the marketplace. We are great because God called us to this place. How can I be so sure? Again, the answer is prophecy. You may be surprised to discover that America appears in Bible prophecy. In fact, America will play a leading role in the final astounding events of planet Earth, as revealed in the book of Revelation. Around the year A.D. 95 or 96, the last of Jesus' twelve disciples is exiled to the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. There, John is given visions revealing the future. John wrote out what the spirit of prophecy had revealed to him in a book called Revelation. Today, I'd like to explore with you a portion of this prophecy. In chapter 13, two beasts are employed to symbolize two powers that will play key roles in our lives today. Read along with me as we look at verses 11 to 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those that dwell in it, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Here in Revelation 13, we discover that there are two beast powers. The first, described in verses 1 through 10, is a beast that at first glance looks like a leopard, but it has seven heads and ten horns. 
The second symbolic beast found in verses 11 to 18 comes up out of the earth. This lamb-like beast only has two horns and finally speaks as a dragon. What are these beasts? I find that the only way to properly understand Scripture is to let it interpret itself. So let's go back to another prophetic book in the Bible and get an interpretive tool in the book of Daniel. We find that he receives a vision that parallels the vision given to King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 2, the king saw an image made of gold, silver, bronze, and iron. In Daniel 7, the prophet receives a vision with four different beasts. What do these beasts symbolize? Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. In those days, a king and his kingdom were synonymous. And verse 23 says, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. These four beasts represent the same four kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Did you catch the interpretive tool? In Bible prophecy, beasts represent kingdoms or nations. So with this tool in hand, let's go back to Revelation 13. Here in Revelation 13, we have two beasts. Do they also represent two kingdoms or powers? Indeed, they do. Careful study reveals the first beast with the seven heads represents the Roman papacy. This prophecy accurately predicted that the papal power would last 42 prophetic months, or 1,260 years, and then receive a deadly wound. History faithfully records that the wound came to the papacy when Napoleon's general, Berthier, took the Pope captive in 1798. That wound was later to be healed according to the same prophecy, but in 1798, most people thought that the Medici papacy was finished. At that point in history, John tells us in verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Folks, prophecy is like an empty glove. For prophecy that has already been fulfilled, we must go back into history and look for a perfect fit. Now, when we make this search, we discover that this lamb-like beast is none other than the United States. But don't take my word for it. Let's compare the prophetic word with the historical indicators. Revelation 13, verses 10 and 11 tells us that while the first beast was going into captivity, a second beast or nation was coming onto the stage of history. The United States declared its independence in 1776, voted the Constitution in 1787, adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was clearly recognized as a world power by 1798. The timing obviously fits America. No other power, nation, or kingdom could possibly qualify. Now, notice another prophetic indicator. This lamb-like beast was to come up out of the earth. What is the significance of the beast coming up out of the earth? Instead of coming up out of the waters, as did the other beast powers mentioned in Daniel and Revelation. Look at what the prophetic angel tells John the waters represent in Revelation 17:15. The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Waters in prophetic symbolism represents multitudes of people. The earth being the opposite represents an absence of multitudes. This new beast nation did not arise from among the masses of humanity, the crowded and struggling nations of the old world, but in a sparsely populated area of this new continent. Does the glove fit? a humble, lamb-like group of pilgrims seeking freedom, landing on a sparsely populated continent of the earth, coming into power and independence by the late 1700s when the papacy was humiliated. Folks, the U.S. fits. Now, all through prophecy, the beasts used to depict certain nations or kingdoms have certain characteristics that help us to match them with the historical realities. The leopard with the four wings and the four heads in Daniel 7 represented Alexander the Great's kingdom. The four wings are a fitting description of the lightning speed with which he came to rule the world. The four heads are a good description of the dividing of power and leadership, for upon his death, his kingdom was divided between his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, who ruled over the kingdoms of Macedonia, Thrace, Egypt, and Syria. So, in looking at the characteristics of this lamb-like beast, what is symbolized by its two horns? 
Horns represent kings and kingdoms or governments according to Daniel 7.24 and 8.21. In this case, they perfectly match with America's two governing principles, civil and religious liberty. These two governing principles have also been labeled republicanism, a government without a king, and Protestantism, a church without a pope. Some have also suggested that these two horns represent our dividing of powers between the president and the people, represented by the Congress. Other nations since ancient times have taxed people to support a state religion. Most have also oppressed religious dissidents, but America established something entirely new, freedom to worship as you wish, without government interference or control, and with government protection. Absence of crown signifies a republican form of government rather than a monarchy. Lamb-like horns denote an innocent, young, non-oppressive, peace-loving, and spiritual nation. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb 28 times in Revelation. So this new government was trying to uphold His principles. No other power on earth could possibly fit the characteristics and the time slot of the Lamb-horned beast except America. Oh, if only you knew how much I wish I could just stop right here in the prophetic description of America. But I can't. Because the prophecy of Jesus continues. And what comes next is jolting and disquieting. The United States of America is truly a great country with its freedom of conscience, press, speech, and enterprise. The protection it provides, its golden opportunities, its sense of fair play, its sympathy for the underdog, and its strong Christian orientation. My eyes are open. It's, it's not perfect. But even still, a host of people from other countries hasten to become American citizens every year. If America's doors were opened wide, a vast portion of the people of the world would move to the United States at once to, to, to heaven on earth as they perceive it. Sadly, this rich, blessed country will change drastically in the days just ahead, precipitating unparalleled heartache and woe for God's people. Notice this disturbing portion of the prophecy of Revelation 13. It says that America will speak like a dragon. Revelation 12:9 and 22 both make it clear that the dragon is none other than Satan. This former angel from heaven hates all those who love God and is quite willing to stand as our accuser in the judgment. Revelation 20:10 says that Satan accuses us before God day and night. Satan has used and continues to use governments and churches to carry out his hatred for God's true people. Who are God's true people, you might ask? Jesus describes them like this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus said it this way when he was here on earth. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Satan used the Babylonian government and religion to persecute Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because Satan wants to be worshipped as God. Because he wants us to disregard God's law, knowing that then we will not be his friends or his people. When Satan speaks as a dragon, he is speaking as a persecuting power. That's the way King Nebuchadnezzar was when he ordered the three Hebrews cast into the fiery furnace for not bowing down to worship his golden image. Satan, the dragon, is not opposed to using force to get people to worship him. And when the United States speaks as a dragon, it will be speaking as an agent of Satan, seeking to force the people to worship contrary to conscience. What specifically will America do that will cause it to speak as a dragon? Notice the first of four crucial points from Revelation 13. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. The first beast power of Revelation 13 was Papal Rome. Notice the first point is the USA exercises the oppressive authority of the papacy. Now, this is the most tragic chapter in human history, but Papal Rome was indeed a persecuting power. The papacy clearly admits doing so, and much supportive evidence exists.